Thank you very much for the introduction and to the organizers for the opportunity to be here. It's really a treat to come to this meeting and it's my first time in Montreal, so thank you for this and hope to be back in the summer. Um, I, <laughs> I uh, also thank you for the interesting topic that you proposed. It's pretty exciting and provocative, really. It's the first time I've ever had to try to speak on this in public. So um, I, um, as a way of disclosure, I, like I said, I, like was mentioned, I'm a site PI on some pediatric trials for hepatitis C and hepatitis B. And I did attend one uh, advisory committee meeting about use of DAAs in pregnancy. Um, but beyond that, this is kind of new territory. Um, the objective today is, is to discuss rationale for and against considering use of DAAs in pregnancy. Thank you. So is pregnancy the next frontier for the DAA rollout? We, we now have excellent regimens for adults with a wide variety of conditions and in all genotypes. And as will be discussed, um, children as young as three years of age can now access um, interferon-free, ribavirin-free DAA therapy. And, um, but pregnant women to, so far um, are, are not, uh, very little is known. And as we'll see, there um, is potential here. So in the past, uh, treatment of hepatitis C in pregnancy was definitely not an option. It was not considered. With pegylated ribavirin, pegylated interferon and ribavirin, um, treatment was contraindicated during pregnancy and even six months prior to conception in both the male and the female, actually. Um, ribavirin is teratogenic at low doses in animal models. And uh, because of its long tissue half-life, um, it was advised not to be taken before conception. And also because of all the adverse effect profile of pegylated interferon and ribavirin, treatment immediately postpartum in women with hepatitis C is, was not really a very practical, practical option. So today we'll be considering briefly the prevalence of hepatitis C in pregnant women and screening efforts for hepatitis C in pregnancy. And we'll be touching on uh, the interactions of hepatitis C on pregnancy and then vice versa, the uh, effects observed of pregnancy on hepatitis C. And then we'll get into the experience um, so far in humans of DAAs in pregnancy and future studies that are needed. So what is the prevalence of hepatitis C in pregnant women? The short answer is we don't know, of course. Uh, in Canada, I've identified four studies, or three studies and four cohorts that gave an estimated prevalence of anti-HCV seroprevalence of 0.5 up to 0.9% over the last two decades. Um, as you'll see, the first one from 1994 reported 0.9% in British Columbia. This was an anonymous sero survey. And then the next two studies from British Columbia are lower at 0.5 and 0.6%. But these are actual real patient testing in the clinic as part of prenatal testing. And this is a risk-based testing where obstetricians identify women with risk factors for hep C and then test them. And in this study, these studies, only 20 to 22% of women had undergone such testing. Mm -hmm. It's now rec well recognized that risk-based testing fails in many uh, conditions and including in the prenatal setting for hepatitis C. As in the US and Canada, the rates of new cases of hepatitis C are increasing in young adults, 20 to 40 years of age, so men and women who are in childbearing age. So given a multitude of studies showing poor performance of risk-based testing on the climbing prevalence of hepatitis C in women of childbearing age due to the opioid crisis, um, and then the emergence of hep C elimination as a public health goal, and then most recently cost-effectiveness studies that now show that universal screening for hepatitis C in pregnancy is, is actually of value, uh, given the potential to treat mothers with increasingly affordable DAA regimens and their children if they're infected. Um, guidance is changing as far as risk-based versus universal screening for hepatitis C in pregnant women. 
As far as I know, as of today, the obstetrics communities in both Canada and the United States still recommend risk-based screening for women um, for hepatitis C um, when they do their prenatal testing in the first trimester. Um, a couple of years ago, the IDSA and AASLD switched to recommending universal screening in pregnancy. And then at the end of 2019, the CDC in the United States um, issued draft guidance um, <coughs> switching from risk-based to universal screening for hepatitis C in pregnancy. So there seems to be movement in that direction. And I suspect in certain countries, this may be the right answer. The CDC, CDC had a caveat that um, they would recommend universal testing in pregnancy in locales where the expected prevalence of maternal hepatitis C was 0.1% or higher. So these are just some back of the envelope calculations. Um, if there are 380,000 births each year in Canada, and as according to a recent review, um, if the maternal prevalence of hepatitis C antibody is 1% in Canada, that'd be 3,800 births per year. And if we can assume that 60% of these women are viremic because we know there's a relatively high rate of spontaneous clearance in young women, that would leave 2,280 births per year to viremic mothers and assuming a 5.8% risk of vertical transmission in HCV mono-infected women, it comes out to about 130 infected children per year. But then when you think that there's you know, 130 million births around the world each year, over 100, over, if the same prevalence or higher is found uh, globally, then over a million hep C infected mothers are delivering each year, and you're talking tens of thousands, up to 50,000 babies born to infected each year. Um, through this route. So now let's switch gears and talk a little bit about what are the effects of pregnancy on hepatitis C infection. It's been well described that um, during pregnancy ALT, in hepatitis C infected mothers, ALT levels actually decline in the latter part of pregnancy and that there's a corresponding inverse in increase in the hep, um, RNA levels. Postpartum, the opposite trend occurs. Sometimes ALT levels flare postpartum, while viral levels go back to baseline, and sometimes they fall markedly. And the figure at the bottom is the first patient that I enrolled as a fellow in a study. Uh, this was actually supposed to be a study about babies, vertical transmission. But the mom story caught our attention. And the, far, the black line shows a pattern of viremia in this mother who had chronic genotype 2B infection. The gray shaded areas reflect her pregnancies. And you can see when she enrolled, she was about to deliver and she had a high level of viremia, 10 to the six or so. And shortly after delivery, within several months, her viral level declined 10,000 fold and um, then settled out in the 10 to the three, 10 to the four range. She had a second pregnancy during our study, showed in the second gray shaded area and her viral levels rose and then again, they fell sharply after delivery, and they actually she spontaneously resolved her infection about a year and a half after the second delivery. Um, her ALTs never, actually never really spiked very high during this, this whole time period. This definitely caught our attention as people who were interested in T-cell immunity to hepatitis C and the understanding that the immune system is, uh, response is exhausted. We are intrigued by what is causing these really dramatic changes in viral levels in the women. And of course, sometimes the things that first get your attention are very dramatic. And subsequently, we've enrolled um, quite a few more women with hepatitis C to assess the natural history of their infection. And um, actually, it turns out spontaneous resolution after pregnancy is pretty rare. And we've only had one other case. Although in Egypt, a genotype 4, there are studies where this is reported more frequently. So if we do find that about a third of women will have a decline of at least a log 10 after delivery. We call them controllers, and two-thirds of women don't have a big shift in viremia with pregnancy. And this postpartum control of viremia has been an interest of ours, and it's been, we and others have found it to be associated with the favorable IL-28B genotype. And we also recently found it to be associated with an improvement in the function of hep C-specific CD4 T cells which is a bit surprising in the chronically infected individuals. We also have um, sequenced the viral genomes from some women with chronic hepatitis C. And uh, we noted, this is that first patient again, after the first drop in virus level, after the first pregnant delivery, 
uh, we sequenced it in the area shown in the red circle. And uh, she had selected new escape mutations in CD8 T cell epitopes. In the second pregnancy, um, one of these epitopes actually went back to wild type. And then post after the second pregnancy, then it escaped again. And these findings suggested that there was real fluctuation of the HCV-specific CD8 T cell selection pressure after pregnancy and, and with the relaxation with the during pregnancy the second time. This is a bit humbling, but all that being said, I'm not sure that in these in very interesting and I think important immunoregulatory changes that we see in pregnancy before or during pregnancy and afterwards will significantly impact the efficacy or safety of DDA therapy as we consider the question that's before us today. But in, they, I think they should be borne in mind. We now know, of course, that DDAs work very well in people who are incre incredibly immunosuppressed. So whether the immunosuppression associated with pregnancy, for instance, would alter their efficacy seems unlikely. Now, this is one slide just looking at the converse effect. What are the effects of hep C on pregnancy outcomes besides the risk for vertical transmission to the infant? And there have been a number of adverse outcomes associated with pregnancy in hepatitis C-infected women, um, including increased risk for intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, which definitely has the highest odds ratio. And then multiple studies have also shown higher risk for low birth weight, prematurity, and gestational diabetes, for instance, in women who have hepatitis C. And for the bottom three particular, there's still a big question of whether these adverse outcomes are related to confounding variables in mothers who have hepatitis C or if they're truly effects of the viral infection itself. These studies all attempted to control for confounding effects. So one interesting idea is that if the adverse effects that have been associated with hep C in pregnancy such as prematurity are actually due to the viral infection and not the confounding factors in the population. There's potential that if we treat during pregnancy, we might see an improvement in some of these pregnancy outcomes for women with hepatitis C. <clears throat> okay, so let's step back. The, what are some rationale then for considering treatment with DAAs during pregnancy? The first set I'd like to consider are the virologic or the infectious benefits. And most importantly, I think we need to emphasize this is an opportunity to cure the mom of hepatitis C and avert the long-term complications of chronic hep C infection. There's also serious potential that we could prevent maternal to child transmission in the existing current, in that particular pregnancy. For sure, we could prevent maternal to child transmission if the mother has a future pregnancy, and we could prevent future horizontal transmission, of course, as well. When a survey was taken of women who had hepatitis C and asked about what do you think about this option of treating um, with DAAs during pregnancy, would you consider it given the little that we know, but we think they're probably safe? And the most compelling, the strongest reason women gave for saying, yes, I'd be willing to take these medicines if they would re um, prevent maternal child transmission. 60% of the women said, yes, I'd be willing to do that. But if they asked them, would you be willing to take these medicines during pregnancy to um, benefit your own health, but it won't prevent maternal to child transmission, only 20% of women said yes to that question. Um, so I think we do need to take into account the values of the, uh, of the moms during this time um, and be advocates for both. So in this case, um, Though I think it's reasonable to hypothesize that treatment of, with DAAs during pregnancy could prevent maternal child transmission. We know from studies of risk factors for vertical transmission, presence of detectable viremia in the mother during the pregnancy is for sure the strongest predictor of the, has the strongest association with um, the risk for vertical transmission. And also there's some evidence that most transmission events happen late or in pregnancy or at the time of delivery, given that uh, more than half of infants will test negative for hepatitis C RNA if you test them by, for RNA in the first couple of days of life, uh, and then they become positive later on. Although there's also compelling evidence that some infants are, are already positive at birth. And actually Dr. Sudan's group did a really interesting study looking at the quasi-species in mothers and in their infected infants. And, doing modeling found that actually, surprisingly, some of these transmissions events probably happened early 
in pregnancy or in middle of the middle of the pregnancy. Um, and these things may need to be considered when you think about when would you give DAA therapies. So again, then beyond the potential virologic rationale for using DAAs in pregnancy, you can think about the um, benefits of the pregnancy itself that we discussed, the possibility of redu reducing prematurity or cholestasis. And then there are a lot of logistic or st strategic reasons to think about treating during pregnancy. Um, pregnancy is a unique period of medical engagement, healthcare engagement for otherwise um, healthy young women. Um, hep C is often first diagnosed during pregnancy. Pregnancy can serve as a time of life transition uh, for women, especially we've seen if it's linked to um, uh, addiction care. And um, women who know that this is also an opportunity to be cured of their infection seem uh, may buy into this idea more. And then <clears throat> more related to the pediatric side of what I do, um, it turns out that it's actually very hard to get exposed babies back for testing. At least in the US, we're doing a very poor job. And, um, well less than half, maybe only 30% or less of exposed babies actually get the testing that's recommended. If we could just cure the mom and prevent vertical transmission during pregnancy, then that's less of a concern. So what are the actual data? What data do we have about the use of DAs in pregnancy? Uh, the preclinical assessments and animal models and <laughs> pharmacodynamic considerations um, we're mostly reassuring. Uh, there's, there's a very nice review just published in the last year, a group out of Netherlands looked at some common important regimens for hepatitis C. And they did acknowledge that for almost all the regimens, the, the, the physiologic changes of pregnancy may um, affect the metabolism and the PK of these drugs. So emphasize the need that the PK would need to be studied in the context of pregnancy. A simple one that I can wrap my mind around is the gastric pH increases during pregnancy, which we know um, for our sofosfavir, lodiposphere combination that I have experience with, the, you know, the pH is important. Um, and then in terms of the um, CYP3A4 induction um, affects obviously a large number of our DAAs. In terms of safety concerns in animal models, it's mostly reassuring. There was in, um, some conflicting report about decladosphere in animals. A potential teratogenic effect was seen in some rodents with external and visceral malformations at relatively high doses in studies reported by the EMA. But confusingly, higher dose studies by the FDA did not find these. So there's still more to be determined about that. And then other regimens had maternal toxicity in rabbits, but not in other rodents, and they weren't necessarily teratogenic signals. So unfortunately, as you may know, the um, animal studies in pregnancy have, um, they have value, but often need to be repeated in, in humans for, to really understand the risk, risk to humans in pregnancy and to the fetus. Okay, so the focus then today is the, this is the first phase one trial of Lodiposphere sofosphere, the first phase one trial of the DAA in pregnancy was reported by Dr. Chappelle out of Pittsburgh last year at CROI. This has not been published yet. Um, so I just went to the CROI website to get these, uh, this information. So the objective of this study was to um, define the safety and virologic response of standard dose Lodiposphere sofosphere in pregnant women. Um, the inclusion criteria were the appropriate genotypes for this regimen, single pregnancies, mothers did not have co-infection, and they all had to plan to deliver at their local hospital. And they were excluded with prior treatments, cirrhosis, uh, ongoing drug abuse problems, and um, if they were at high risk for preterm birth. The, during this time period, which was relatively short, they had 170 women with hep C viremia come through their clinic but after all the inclusion and exclusion, only nine women were enrolled. So um, showing the difficulty of, of meeting all these criteria. Um, so the study design was to initiate therapy with the uh, diposphere sofosphere at about 23 to 24 weeks uh, for 12 weeks. 
They wanted to start after you know, the main period of organogenesis in the first trimester, but also soon enough that they could hopefully be finished with the regimen before the mother delivered. They looked at PK every four weeks, and then maternal samples at delivery, and for a postpartum for an SVR12. Thank you, almost there, sorry. Um, the infants were um, assessed at delivery and then at follow-up for vertical transmission and adverse effects. What are the outcomes? The mothers, um, most importantly, SVR12 was achieved in all mothers. Um, side effects were only mild. Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and fatigue. And then PK is still dating, still pending. And none of the infants were infected. Um, and the birth exams were normal, but long-term infant follow-up is still pending. There have been three additional studies, two, two additional abstracts and one actual published case report looking at DAAs in pregnancy. And just to get to the heart of the matter, the first one is the largest from India. There are 15 women who received adiposphere sofosbuvir. In this case, all the women were cured, side effects were mild, and they Babies had normal birth exams. We don't know about vertical transmission. There's a one case report of HIV co-infected mother. And then the last one's different. It, this was in Egypt, eight women who actually had started their therapy for hep C and then became pregnant. So these are cases where the, the it was first trimester exposure to the medications. And the most important data there is that all eight infants appeared normal, no obvious congenital malformations. So in summary of the human experience with DAAs in pregnancy, there have been 33 reported cases to date. Um, in 25, it was second or third trimester treatment, and all of these women achieved SVR12. Of the 10 babies who were followed for vertical transmission, none that had that. And then we had those eight cases of first trimester exposure. Um, so far, maternal adverse effects appear mild. There's no obvious teratogenicity in the small number of cases but it's too soon to say anything about the infant's outcomes or uh, impact on vertical transmission. Two more slides, I'm sorry here. So to, um, we do need to have some circumspection though here to realize that while these data are promising, the risk of vertical transmission itself naturally is low and hep C is readily, readily curable in children. And we, if we're gonna expose um, while there's to this, 19 out of 20 babies will be exposed to this drug, even though these drugs, even though they wouldn't be infected anyway. So we want to make sure these are safe in other ways for the children. Um, so in order, I think it's, we owe it to the mothers and the babies then to conduct rigorous trials to know that they are in fact safe. P phase one trials still need to be done in the actual pangenotypic regimens that are now available. And then we need follow-up trials of sufficient size to look at maternal to child transmission reduction, which is what the moms really care about. And I think which would motivate a lot of us, as well as the safety, teratogenicity, and the long-term infant development. <coughs> Ideally, these studies would be controlled, randomized and controlled, uh, maybe comparing treatment during pregnancy versus immediately postpartum. I, do th I don't think that all the babies will necessarily have normal infant neurodevelopment after exposure to DAAs because these babies will also be exposed to opioids and uro and other factors. So unless you have a rigorous control group, um, you may raise unnecessary red flags about the safety of DAAs in pregnancy. And in the meantime, we can focus on improving recognition of maternal hepatitis C in a lot of places the answer there is universal screening, and then build infrastructure to treat women before and after pregnancy. So, all right, thank you.